archived. But in case you have not done it, please complete those tracings that I gave you. Uh, this is for students. And then uh, uh, while you're doing it, if you get any questions, post them in the community. Okay, somebody would answer them. Okay. So what today today the focus is on completing this chapter and backtracking. And uh, <clears throat> the topic that we will talk about today is the Hamiltonian circuit. Okay. So right off the bat, you will get an exercise, as you know by now what we do. Uh, but let me first define what a Hamiltonian circuit or a cycle is. Okay. Then you do the exercise for about 10 minutes. Okay. So here is the definition of a Hamiltonian cycle. Just focus on the definition, not the problem statement part. We'll come back to that later. Okay. What is a Hamiltonian cycle? It's a graph. In a, it's a cycle in a graph is, I mean, a Hamiltonian cycle in a graph is a cycle that visits each vertex exactly once. Okay. So, and then I'll tie this to our data structures things as we go along. Okay. So you have a graph, and we can say a graph has a cycle, Hamiltonian cycle. If we are able to visit each of the vertices exactly once and come back to where we started from. Let's say the graph has A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Let's say your starting point is A. You have to go from A to B or whatever the order. Okay, for convenience, I'll call it. You go to B, C, D, E, F, G and come back to A. As long as you can find a path like that, where you are visiting each of the nodes exactly once, then you say that the graph has a Hamiltonian cycle. Okay, intuitively pretty easy to understand, right? So what I want you to do over the next ten minutes is the following exercise. Okay, whether you call it a cycle or a circuit, it's the same thing. So there are two aspects, there are two things here in this exercise today. One is, I gave you three graphs there. Uh, find the Hamiltonian circuit in each of the graphs below. The three one, the three things. That's what I mean by graphs below. Uh, notice in the graphs, I did not give the nodes a name. Obviously, when you are doing this one, you may want to name the nodes or the vertices. Okay. Name them one, two, three, four, five, or A, B, C, D, E, or whatever comes to your mind. Okay, and then uh, uh, show me if you can find a Hamiltonian cycle or a circuit. Remember the definition. Definition is we have to visit each of the vertices, whatever your starting vertex is. Okay. Uh, you have, to you, have to you have to reach all the traverse, all the vertices exactly once and come back. Okay? That is the first part of the exercise. The second part of the exercise is more for fun uh, because it's, we need to know, the, know some definitions, right? Uh, so what is the degree of the graph that I gave you below? Right? So that is the second part. So the time starts now. Take about 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes. If somebody answers well before then, we keep moving on, right? If I get a few answers before 10 minutes, then we keep moving on. Okay. Your time starts now, and I will go on mute. And I'm monitoring the chat if you have any questions. As monitoring the chat to see if I can ask any questions. Now I now it should be audible because I'm talking. Okay, if you can hear me, you type that you can hear me in the chat. Degree of the graph. How are you defining the degree of the graph? Can somebody put the definition of what a degree of the graph is in the chat? 
Did all college students get the degree correctly? I'm assuming you did. If not, one of the guys who put the answer here, if they put the definition there, then it becomes clear to you. Your answer degree is five, put the definition. How did you arrive at that? Once you put it, then I'll also explain. PVP Siddhartha, can you put how you arrived at that? On, on Hamiltonian circuits and paths, right? Give me a second. My system is running a little bit slow. I do not know if it is a WebEx issue or my laptop issue. So, and then you are going to be inspecting all the fire hydrants. Fire hydrants are what, like all these fire engines, when they go running to these localities where there is fire, usually in these localities there is a fire hydrant. That's where they hook up the pipes to and they get water out of that. Okay? So, uh, monthly or annually or once in six months, uh, they, the fire department sends out an inspector saying go to all these locations and uh, go inspect them and make sure they're all working. If they're not working, figure out a plan to fix them, right? So obviously, as an inspector traveling to different routes, I want to optimize the route, right? So you're starting from the garage where the, the office is, and then you want to visit each intersection exactly once and return to the garage. Okay, very practical problem, right? So as you can see in the picture here, uh, G on the right side is the garage. And all the other locations are labeled, right? So uh, now I want to explore a path, okay? Can somebody tell me a path? Put it in the chat as a group group exercise. What, what could be a, a Hamiltonian uh, path here or a cycle starting from the garage. I, I shouldn't, yeah, I can call it a cycle in a way or a path. So starting from G, I have to cover all the nodes there. Uh, put, put the answer in the, in, the, in the chat for me. Looks like I can go from G to, uh, I can let's say I go G, H, F. If I do E, G, H, F, E, E to D, C, A, B, B to J, and J to I, and from I to G. Right? That is one path. The other parts too, right? I could perhaps do GHF. Uh, then I can go to uh, D. After D, D, C, A, B, B to E, E to J, J to I, and G. So there are different parts, okay? Give something. Notice that one path meets this criteria. Some answer I gave you. So, of course, there's a condition saying that it's not necessary that every edge of the graph needs to be traversed when visiting each vertex exactly once. Those two don't necessarily correlate. So why do we call this Hamiltonian cycle or a Hamiltonian path, right? So there is this Irish scientist, right, long time ago, 1805 to 1865, William Rowan Hamilton, okay? He invented a game, okay? 
So where the game basically shows a graph where the vertices represented the major cities in Europe. Okay. And then of course he sold that game to some game dealer. Okay. And the game looked like this. Uh, in math, if you take math, you, you hear all these concepts, right, in our geometry class. Like you have a regular, uh, how do you say that, dodeca, dodecahedron, like this, right? Uh, and then all these uh, nodes represent the cities. And uh, the task is to find a circular tour along the edges of this dodecahedron, visiting each city exactly once. Turns out that is nothing but a Hamiltonian cycle. So by looking at a cycle in a graph, you are able to determine the solution. Okay. So that's what this explains. The object of the game is to find the path that visited each of the 20 vertices exactly once. Okay. So we just name that in his honor. Now, why is it interesting, right? There are a lot of, I mean, especially from a math viewpoint, it's a very intriguing problem, okay? So far, there is no simple test that has been determined or found whether a graph has a Hamiltonian circuit or not, okay? Um, very interesting, right? We know the definition. But sometimes it's kind of hard to uh, prove whether the path exists or not. Yeah, for small graphs, yeah, we can visually see that we can try out the combinations. Okay, there is no general solution. Okay, to find that. Uh, these are a class of problems when we talk about these uh, uh, no solution found and all that. Uh, in uh, in automata theory, we talk about uh, NP problems, okay? NP, NP complete, NP hard, and things like that. Uh, we we I remember last class. I think it was this version of the class or the second semester, the other one that I taught, the first version of this class. Uh, some faculty members said, "Can I give them a small uh, tutorial?" On, on the classification of NP problems and what they mean to us. Uh, I will try to do the same thing, if not uh, in today's lecture, maybe next class, okay? But suffice to say, when we talk about uh, something like uh, a problem can be solved in polynomial time, what it means is, in educated layman's in a finite amount of time, we can find a solution. Okay, whereas when we talk about a NP complete problem, um, we cannot solve a problem in polynomial time. Okay. However, we can verify whether the problem exists or not in a polynomial time. Okay, and then yeah, and then uh, N is a subset of NP. Okay. Can n be equal to n p? No one can prove it. That has not been proved yet. So there's a lot of theoretical analysis of n n and n p and n p hard and so on. Um, but kind of like going away from the topic. Okay. So Hamilton Hamiltonian gave a theorem called Hamiltonian theorem. Okay. What the theorem basically guarantees is. For certain kinds of graphs, remember we already said that it's very hard to know for a general graph whether there exists a Hamiltonian circuit or not, okay? But if you reduce the scope of the problem to a manageable unit, okay, then the theorem basically guarantees the existence of a Hamiltonian cycle, okay? So what is the theorem? The theorem basically says look at the second bullet. Can you guys hear me? First? 
So, so what does Hamiltonian say? He showed, he proved that when you have n vertices, and n now is greater than two, okay, and if each vertex has a degree of at least n by two, okay. So if uh, remember, we, we I gave you a degree example. You know what a degree is. So as long as each vertex has a degree of at least n by two, then the graph has a Hamiltonian circuit. Okay. Everyone understands that. So what did they? What Hamilton did was in the general class, it's an NP hard problem to solve. You cannot prove or disprove that it exists or doesn't exist. However, if you put a condition on a graph, okay, that each vertex has degree of uh, at least n by two. It could be more, but it has to be at least n by two. Then the graph has a Hamiltonian circuit. Or oh, those beeps that I'm getting in my Bluetooth headset could be, maybe I'm running out of battery in the Bluetooth. Okay. Uh, let me revert to uh, a handheld device. Okay, I went back to my phone as opposed to the Bluetooth uh, headset. Okay, so now, now it becomes easy, right? So what is the degree of this graph here on the left? Visually seeing it is one, one, two, three, right? The graph graph is three, I think. Yeah, three, one, two, no, three, four. This degree of graph, this is four. One, two, three, yeah, four. If you look at the node on the top right, our, our convention was starting from left and labeled them one, two, three, four, five. So if you look at the deg uh, degree of uh, vertex two, you know the degree is one, two, three, four. Okay? Uh, I, so the degree is one, two, three, four. So for each vertex, if you divide by two, as long as it has two or more, if the degree of each vertex is two or more, then that should have a Hamiltonian path. Okay. Um, so same thing, you can you can see that the second one by default, it's a trivial case, right? The degree of the graph is what, two. Two by two is one. So every node has a degree of one for sure, right? At least. So it has a Hamiltonian path. But if you look at the third one, uh, what is the degree of that graph? I can see one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, yeah, three. So three by two. So I don't know whether you take, uh, you take, uh, uh, you take three by two and then you take the upper ceiling and convert it to two or I think you do that if I'm not mistaken. So it doesn't satisfy that criteria. So based on that itself, we can tell that this thing does not have a Hamiltonian cycle or a path. the graph of degree of at least five by two, the graph has circuit. Now notice the second bullet here. The theorem does not tell as to how to find the circuit. Theorem only says whether it has the circuit or not. But the theorem cannot show us how to find that circuit. Okay? By the way, if a graph has some vertices with degree less than n by two, the theorem does not apply. See, I was hesitating when I was explaining that, right? The third one, when it did not have a Hamiltonian circuit, in that particular circuit, the graph, one of the, the degree C, it has to be n by two, right? Uh, some faculty member can verify it. Uh, does it take n by two? Five by two is taken as 2.5 or is it taken as three? I don't remember. And one of you can verify that. So if it doesn't satisfy that condition for some of the vertices, you cannot apply the theorem. Okay. So 
some figures were there. I think I deleted them, but it was referring to the uh, it was referring to uh, only by inspection. We could say that the second figure has a Hamiltonian circuit, okay, based on the theorem. Where a third one, uh, we had to do it only by visualizing, not by applying the theorem, because some of the vertices have degrees which are uh, less than uh, less than the n by two concept. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is kind of like a more like a fun thing here to explain, right? So before Hamiltonian circuits and all came, the famous Euler, everyone knows Euler, right? Famous mathematician and all that stuff. So he came up with what is known as a Euler circuit, okay? As opposed to a Hamilton Hamiltonian circuit. Circuit is same as cycle, okay? Okay. So. Uh, it's kind of like an unfair comparison, but they're two distinct concepts. No one really proved anything with respect to correlation between a Euler circuit and a Hamiltonian circuit. Okay. In Euler circuit, the way the, uh, it is defined is, you're visiting every edge of the graph exactly once. Hamiltonian focuses on vertices. Euler circuit focuses on edges. Okay. Um, that is what a Euler circuit is, okay? Now I gave some examples here, like uh, the author talks about a competition where every player must play every other player, okay? How do you represent that, okay? And then you're representing where the graph shows, uh, in the graph you have vertices, and each of the vertices are players, okay? Uh, so you, when you, when you show that as a graph, if you notice, since every player has to play every other player, you get a complete graph. What is a complete graph? Complete graph is every node is connected to every other graph. Okay. Obviously, in a tournament where you have a, every player has to play another player, you get a complete graph. And they gave some uh, some. Uh, um, Examples about the direction by using the concept of directed arrow in, in their definition, when you have a directed arrow from vertex A to vertex B, the arrow shows who defeated who. Okay, the starting of the arrow shows okay. Now it turns out that every such graph contains a Hamiltonian path. So once you have a Hamiltonian path, it's kind of possible to rank the teams in order from winner to loser. Okay. I don't show you how to do all of those things, but I'm just saying this is the type of analysis that was done. Okay. So here is an example that I gave. Uh, here. So you have four teams here. They all play the school soccer round robin tournament. Okay. So you have A, B, C, D. So the game, the first row shows game. Game A, B means A and B played. And the winner was B. Uh, similarly, A and C played, the winner was A. Okay, so how to draw a graph to show the tournament? Because these are all the, you know how many games are there, right? Who are the winners? And you're drawing a directed graph because an arrow shows who won and who lost, right? Okay. So taking this made this table, how to draw a graph to represent the tournament, and then finding a Hamiltonian path, and then rank the participants from winners to losers. Okay. We're not doing the exercise. Okay. So in path here, it shows like D, B, D, B, A, C. D, B, uh, where is the A? A is the one on the top, A, C, okay? 
So when you have that path, it turns out that D is the, because it's a directed graph, right? Uh, you can see when you have a directed graph, you have to follow the directions. So by default, by traversing that path from DBAC, you know that D is first, because remember, D beat B, D beat A, D beat C. That's why you see three arrows going from D outward, okay? When I look at the diagram, I know that B beat A and B beat C. Top left is A and bottom right is C there, guys, okay? So that's how you can clearly see that you can rank order them uh, using the concept of Hamiltonian path, who won the tournament, who came second, third, fourth, and so on. There are a couple of practice problems there that I put there. Um, we are not doing them in the class, uh, but they are there for you to play with in case you are curious about how how these concepts are used, okay? Now, that's all good theory, right? Graph theory and all that. How do we, how do we realize this in terms of programming, in terms of computer science, okay? So there must be a way to solve it, right? Ultimately, we are software engineers and we need to figure out how to write an algorithm. Now, this is where we get into using the concept of trees and backtracking to solve a Hamiltonian circuit problem, okay? So I gave a graph on the left, A, B, C, D, E, F, okay? So it gives you instructions saying, saying we make vertex A the root of the state space tree. We are transposing that into a tree, right? Okay. So then we are saying that the first component of the future solution, if it exists, is the first intermediate vertex. Meaning you're basically exploring each of the vertices, right? Okay. And then we are going to break the tie break by taking the lower alphabet first. Okay. So if you look at the alphabet order to make the three-way try among the vertices adjacent to A, because we're starting with A, right? You have D, B, and C adjacent to A. And we are trying to form a path, right? Ultimately, I mean path or a cycle, okay? So to, tie, to break the tie, we say that we select B because we are taking the lower alphabet, okay? Now from B, what are the adjacent vertices from B? B, F, C, and F, okay? So we go to C, and from C we go to D and E. Out of those two, I select D because we're taking the lower number, okay? And from D we go to E, right? Because we already came from A, A, B, C, D, we don't, don't go back, we go to E, okay? And finally to F. So you have A, B, I don't know why I wrote, uh, so when I, I, what is the solution? I think I wrote the thing in the solution, I think on the left, right? When you say A, B, F, uh, E, C, D, A, that is the path, okay? Uh, but in the, in the explanation that they give you when you go it that way, uh, for, you went what, A, A to B, B to C, C to D, D to E, and finally to F. Going that path, okay? But we do know there is a path that exists visually, okay? So what do we do when you reach a dead end? We know now, whenever we reach a dead end, you backtrack. That's what the backtracking problem is, right? When you reach a dead end, in the state space tree, because we're representing the problem space as a tree. And in the process of reaching the dead end, you mark it, you backtrack to the previous node from which you came to the dead end. Then to D, then to C, okay? And that is what provides the first alternative for the algorithm to pursue, okay? So now going from C to E, useless, obviously you have to trace it by looking at the picture. So then you algorithm has to backtrack. Remember backtracking is recursive. 
in the in the example that you have traced or I asked you to trace, you have noticed that, right? There's always one sub program which shows you how to backtrack to the previous node. Now, in order to backtrack, you're keeping track of the previous node, right? A couple of arrays were declared and so on. Okay. So you basically follow that backtracking algorithm. Uh, and eventually you will come up with the with the Hamiltonian circuit. Okay. And similarly, you can basically extend that to find many Hamiltonian circuits starting from Because once solution is found, you can still backtrack to see if there are other paths. Things, this should this should look familiar to you, right? We do something similar, right? In state space trees, when we did the uh, subsets problem and then the uh, queens problem, right? So there's a path. You start from A A to B, and you it's at one level there, and from B you go to C. Like that, you fill this tree, and you can see all the dead ends are marked. Okay, so this is how you arrive at the solution. Let me pause here. Questions, comments? Where did my chat go? Slides which I removed, which I thought are not really useful to get into too many details. What happened? Sorry, I clicked something. In terms of summarizing backtracking, uh, first of all, it's applied to very difficult combinatorial problems. These are all the NP hard, NP complete type of stuff where it cannot be solved in finite time. Okay. Uh, cannot find exact solutions to begin with. So you, it's like a backtracking is almost like a trial and error, right? You make the best guess, you go forward, and if you get stuck, you backtrack, okay? So at least, so compared to exhaustive search, we have tried to minimize the number of searches to arrive at a solution, okay? Um, that is what we are aiming for. Now, it turns out it's not always the case that backtracking eliminates uh, some of the state space. We may, our backtracking algorithm may eventually search all the possible combinations depending on the problem, okay? Uh, but at least it gives you some hope. That is what the moral of the story is for backtracking. Okay. Uh, let me see. I think I reached the end of this presentation. Let me pause here. You can practice those problems, but as a take home, you'll take a. This is what I'll do before I give you a five minute break. Sorry, guys, I'm typing, but it is it is taking time for it to show. Code for you to trace, right? So now you discover a piece of code and trace it. Everyone understands the assignment, take home assignment. Is there anyone who doesn't understand? Raise your hand or put your question in the chat. Let me look at the participants here. For the Hamiltonian circuit problem. Okay. And then you have to trace it. I don't think I gave you the C code for that, right? So you can find it, okay. So what we are going to do now is, let's take a five minute uh, I don't think your syllabus requires you to 
no, no. Then we also talked about, hey, this can be solved like proportional to n, the input size, uh, n squared. We talked about n squared, n cubed, and things like that. We also talked about um, n factorial, right? Some algorithms, complex distribution. So when you start looking at these exponential algorithms, uh, that those we said are non-polynomial time algorithms. These are some of the terms that we used. Okay, so P is for polynomial, and then P is loosely speaking non-polynomial. Okay, so so there's a lot of uh, analysis that goes on. So here are a couple of slides on that. Uh, We'll stop when when it gets too complex, okay? Um, so here is a review, okay? So when what do we mean when we say a problem is in P? That basically means the solution can be found in polynomial time. Polynomial time in educated layman terms is limited amount of time, finite amount of time, okay? Now what does NP mean? Notice the answer there, very, very subtle answer. We are not saying that we are finding a solution, okay? We cannot find a solution. NP means we cannot find a solution, okay, in polynomial time. However, given a solution, right, somebody says here is a solution, you can verify whether that solution is valid or not in polynomial time, okay? You see the difference between that? We are not saying we will find the solution in polynomial time, but however, if you say this is a solution, then I can test it and tell whether it is true or not in finite amount of time. That is what NP is, okay? Everyone, everyone understand the definition of P and NP here? Put it in the chat. Do you understand P and NP? So, uh, not doing it here, obviously. Okay. So, P means we can solve it. Okay. We can literally solve it through an algorithm and we can get an answer in finite amount of time. But when a problem is NP problem and somebody says that, we cannot solve it. But what we can do is if they give a, a point solution saying, hey, can you say the solution? is valid for this problem, we can verify it. Remember, verification is nothing but testing, okay? Now, mathematically, turns out B is a subset of, P is a subset of NP, okay? That has been proven that P is a subset of NP. But no one really knows today whether P is equal to NP. That has not been proven, okay? That's one aspect of it. Now, what does NP complete mean? Okay. Okay. So, we say that a problem P can be reduced to some problem Q. Okay. Now, we'll see what it means. Okay. Now, how do we reduce it from one problem to another problem? Okay. And then once you reduce to another problem, then we come up with this thing called what does NP hard mean? Okay, and then and then we have to define what does it mean to say that the problem is NP complete. So these are the uh, answers that we need to get.
Okay? Okay? So in our comment theory, we say, hey, we can, we can reduce the problem P to problem Q. This is what we, we basically mean by that. We say that, hey, P is no harder than Q. So if we can solve Q, we can solve P. That is what it means, okay? Okay, and then you will be able to transform when you're saying you're reducing one problem to another problem. Uh, we are basically saying that, as, as the definition says, right, the transformation itself of instance of P to Q can occur in polynomial time. Okay, if you want to tra transpose a given problem to another domain, if it takes more time, or non-polynomial time, it's no good. We are able to transpose that in polynomial time. Okay, and then you can see the other definition, NP hard and NP complete, right? Uh, but the bottom line is whenever we talk about these things as computer scientists and educated layman terms, the moment you see NP or NP hard or NP complete, that basically means that you cannot solve those problems in, in finite amount of time, okay? So there are lots of problems like that, uh, which are, uh, because I, I believe if I remember right, the NP hard problems, you cannot even verify in polynomial time, okay? Whether the solution is right or wrong, okay? So that's how you have a bunch of classifications uh, for for the class of problems that are solved, okay? And uh, proving, we don't have to get into that. And then when we talk about these NP things, you can clearly see that, I think I mentioned that in our in our slide deck today, right? These, these fall under the NP complete class of problems. I can verify, but I cannot prove whether something exists. Given a graph, I cannot prove whether there's a Hamiltonian cycle or not, okay? That's why it's called an NP-complete problem, okay? Um, this rest of the, and then this, yeah, this is another interesting thing. Where do we really use TSP? What is TSP? Traveling salesman problem. Remember we talked about traveling salesman problem earlier? The goal is, uh, imagine, I think we use the example of a JNT coordinator, right? And the coordinator has to visit each of these colleges for inspection and come back to Kakinada. That's a traveling salesman problem. So how do you optimize the route? Now, does that problem exist for airlines? Uh, you have all these airlines in India, right? Um, like, uh, what is it, Indigo, Jet, what is that, Jet Airways and all of those things. Now, you do know that flying the, the, the fuel, the jet fuel that goes is super expensive, right? As, at least it used to be. That is what brought down the flamboyant founder of Kingfisher, right? What that guy's name, Malia, remember? So, why is this problem important for airline industry? Can you tell me why? Why this Hamiltonian cycle, Hamiltonian path, which gets transported, I think, for airline industry? Who can answer that question? Can somebody answer that question? Why do you think this is an important problem for airline industry? You can put it in the chat. Because these are the practical applications of this, right? This is not just theory. Uh, we are applying very practically to these situations. The answer is obvious, right? If you do not optimize the path, uh, it, it has an impact, right? It has an impact on what? What factors it has an impact on? It has an impact on time, how much it takes to cover everything, correct? And time is equivalent to cost too, right? Because they have to use more jet fuel. If they don't optimize their airline path, the guy, let's say the plane, typically the way the airline industry works, the plane starts in the morning at some, some source, okay? Let's call it, let's say, what is the nearest airport that you have? I think it's 
Vizag, I think, right? Let's say the plane starts in Vizag. The goal is to take the flight on a path where it stops at different destinations and reaches the final destination back to Vizag. Because next day again, it has to do that. Okay. So if it is visiting cities like Hyderabad, Chennai, Bombay, Delhi, Ahmedabad, different circuits like that, right? And then you'll come back to Vizag. You want to minimize the time it takes to go to all these destinations and come back on time because you want to save time and then you want to save on fuel, right? So very practical application of, a, of this Hamiltonian cycle. We use that concept basically to solve the traveling sales problem. And uh, if you get into theory, we show how this gets transposed, and uh, and of course how we how do how we resolve the issue of coming up with the uh, with the right solution. Okay. Uh, and then uh, it gets into more more theory here. Ultimately, all these things there are a couple of. Uh, um, Turing machine related concepts. Okay, one of the concepts is satisfiability. All these things have to satisfy the criteria called satisfiability. It shows an example here, right? Given a Boolean expression of n variables, can we assign values such that the expression is true? So he gave an expression there, right? X1, X2, or not of that, and so on, right? Uh, how do we prove? Cook, the guy, scientist called Cook, who said, hey, it's an NP complete, pro NP complete problem. Okay, cannot solve it in polynomial time. Okay, but, but if we give the values and say whether it meets that or not, we can solve that. Okay, so they are, not, they are different uh, theoretical concepts related to that. Uh, enough of that. There's another slide which I wanted to show you. Let me check. Yeah, this one. So it shows uh, through uh, our uh, set theory concepts where uh, all these things fall into play. Remember, P is a subset of NP. We said that in the beginning. That's why you see the P, po P problems there, the subset of NP. And then you have NP hard problems. Okay. So, uh, which is another circle by itself. The intersection of NP and NP hard is the NP complete problems because ultimately, from a computer scientist viewpoint, what is an NP complete problems? Uh, we can verify. We cannot solve, but we can verify. If it is true NP hard problems, okay, they cannot even be verified. But only a subset of the NP hard problems can be verified. That's why you see. NPC, okay? Not all NP hard problems can be reduced to NPC, okay? So that is, the, that is one of the graphical ways we show these problems, okay? Okay, let me pause here. Uh, that's all I wanted to say on, on the, uh, the P and NP and NP complete and NP hard. Uh, I do not know when in, in which year of your curriculum you take automata theory. I, I'm not even sure if it is taught in undergrad level in India. Um, but all computer scientists, especially if you want to know the theory, we always take a course on automata theory and we get in deep into this P and N, P and P, C and B art. So I have some definitions there, how we do this. I'll try to put these slides in the community, okay? I have to clean them up because I have information scattered in different sets of slide decks. I just start to collate them and put it there. I will do that uh, uh, before end of the term. I don't expect uh, any questions or uh, exam questions related to this in, uh, in your particular class. But it's good to know what these are, okay? Okay, let me stop here. The class is so silent. Any questions, comments? 
and be complete and be hard mean i can pass the ball to you and and then you can add some of your thoughts great machine okay if the if the input data size is small okay so uh, because of the high, great computers that we have the technology what it is enabling us to do in the industry is the bad programmers are getting away with bad code because the machines are so fast right uh, so there there is literally practically speaking not much emphasis on praise on efficiency of the code in average companies i'm not talking about top notch um if you take like an uber or a google or a facebook uh, i know my kids went to the interview process to get jobs there right uh, these are all the type of optimization problems that they have to literally on the fly in an interview write down the algorithm okay um, but if you go past those companies the standard it consulting firms and they do this work in it departments and companies like cisco uh have seen pretty pathetic code not paying attention to any performance right if you know this theory then you will be able to do it well okay enough of my preaching what we learned in the previous units when we come to that we will see it uh we will uh, talk about the traveling salesman problem again and of course our famous zero one knapsack problem right and then uh, you have a low cost and a fee we have different types of branch and bond solution low cost five four first in first out and things like that so we'll we'll cover that uh the 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 interesting thing is right we are talking about the same problems in and how they can be solved in different methods right uh, we talked about knapsack and greedy method we talked about knapsack and dynamic i don't think we talked about knapsack and backtracking did we i don't think it applies there uh so same same types of techniques right so it's kind of like you should know hey this looks like a a knapsack problem and then then you can say oh if it's a knapsack problem then uh, uh, if i take the greedy method it does not give me an optimal solution maybe i should use dynamic programming to get at an optimal solution so you should be able to make those kinds of uh, uh, quick thinking type of things to solve such problems in the industry okay great guys i have nothing